Welcome to another edition of Cannabis Conversations. I'm Martin Lee with Project CBD, and today we are privileged to have with us in the studio Dr. Rachel Knox, who is uh, the co-founder of the American Cannabinoid Clinics with other members of your family who are also physicians. Um, also, you are the chairwoman of the Oregon Cannabis Commission. Correct. So That's glad it. you can join us. <laughs> Thanks for uh, having me. I wanted to ask you about um, something you've been lecturing about to various audiences. Uh, you refer to endocannabinology. Yeah. Maybe you can tell us what is endocannabinology? Yeah. So in medicine, we, we, we silo our fields into ologies, really. So people are familiar with cardiology and endocrinology, um, neurology. And really what we mean is the study of the function and dysfunction of those systems. So in cannabis medicine, the focus for a long time has been on the cannabis, but people come to us with physical conditions and we doctors are trained to treat the patient. So what we're really treating is the endocannabinoid system when we're assessing different disease processes or symptoms. And so it made sense to, to me and my family at the American Cannabinoid Clinics to call ourselves endocannabinologists who practice endocannabinology and we use cannabis, which is probably, as far as we know, the most versatile tool that works on that system, but uh, along with lots of other things that help us treat that system. So endocannabinology means the study of the function and dysfunction of the endocannabinoid system and all the ways we can modulate it. Well, let's talk about the endocannabinoid system for a moment. Uh, what, what is its purpose? How do you break it down in terms of its components? Yeah, as far as we know, right, because there's still so much more to know, but our understanding is that the endocannabinoid system is the maestro to the symphony that is every physiological system in the human body. And its role is to keep us in balance, to keep us healthy. So a perfectly functioning and in tune endocannabinoid system keeps us in perfect health. Um, but the reality is that we're, we're inundated with toxic you know, environments and emotional and physical stress and poor foods and, I mean, you name it, this endocannabinoid system of ours is having to battle a lot of insults um, today. And it's really hard for it to keep us in balance, which is why so many people are struggling with so many diseases. But again, its role is to keep us in balance and it does that through a very intricate feedback loop, right? Because it's, it's constantly in flux, it's constantly adapting and reacting to everything that we're throwing at it. And so it has to work in sort of a feedback system, right, in response to what we're throwing at it. And for a long time, we've talked about the endocannabinoid system in four components, or we talk about the four components of it. Uh, the first components were discovered between 1988 and 92, and those were the CB1 and CB2 receptors. Um, mixed in there was the first endocannabinoid or endogenous cannabinoid, cannabinoid made in our body, anandamide, shortly followed by 2-AG. So we have the, the cannabinoids that work on those cannabinoid receptors, like a, a lock and a key. And then we have the enzymes that create those endocannabinoids on demand when they're needed, again, right? constantly responding to stimuli, and we have the enzymes that break those cannabinoids down when they're no longer needed. It is a system that runs uh, all by itself. We call it auto-regulatory, and it works when it's needed, on demand, in response to, again, what we're doing to it. So, so why do, if, if we have the system and it's working all the time, why do we need cannabis then? Because I, I, I mentioned the things that we're doing to ourselves in today's age, right? We talk about inflammation as the root cause of disease. Um, and, and that's true. We're causing inflammation, but the endocannabinoid system is immunomodulating. It's, it's supposed to keep inflammation in check. It can't do that when we're constantly eating inflammatory foods, when we're constantly under stress, right? Um, the endocannabinoid system works like this, right? So if a cell is sending um, signals of pain or, or stress or inflammation to each other, well, the receiving cell is supposed to create an endocannabinoid that it shoots back to the, the cell sending that signal to turn it off to restore balance and harmony. 
unfortunately, we're getting in our own way in some respects, right? Um, the system is being overwhelmed and overloaded with constant signals of stress, pain, inflammation. It's very difficult under those conditions for it to properly make these endocannabinoids. One, we need to eat omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids to even make these cannabinoids. So a lot of us are, are, are deficient in the foods that are essential to even create these endocannabinoids. And we're working out a deficiency, right? So that comes, or there comes in uh, a very good place for phytocannabinoids. So THC, right, it's been around for a long time in, in our colloquial world around cannabis. THC is an anandamide mimicker, right? Anandamide was that first endocannabinoid that was discovered. Well, THC mimics it. So if we're having trouble developing anandamide, it makes sense to supplement with THC for it to take the place of anandamide and help restore some of that function by working on those cells that are constantly sending those signals of pain, stress, and inflammation. So it's kind of like in conventional medicine where we might recommend a supplement to a patient, right? If you're deficient in vitamin D, well, we give you exogenous vitamin D, you take it in a pill form. Using THC in that way to supplement anandamide is no different than what we already do in the conventional world. Mm -hmm. And it would be similar for CBD, cannabidiol, the, the non-toxic, or you should say non-intoxicating, because cannabinoids are yeah. not toxic. Um, how does CBD play into this? Well, similarly, right, in general, THC and CBD have a lot of overlapping downstream effects. But CBD does not mimic our anandamide or 2-AG. Um, CBD does something very special with respect to THC um, and anandamide. And what that does, uh, it, it blocks the breakdown of anandamide. So wherein we might use THC to supplement somebody who's deficient in anandamide, we might use CBD to prevent the breakdown of anandamide and keep the anandamide levels higher indirectly. Um, CBD also binds what we call allosterically to the CB1 receptor. And when it binds allosterically, meaning not at the same site THC binds to, but maybe over here, it changes the conformation of that receptor site. So it's THC binds to it, but a little bit differently. And that's one of the reasons we think CBD has such a significant impact on um, diminishing or dampening the intoxicating and euphorogenic properties of THC. That's one of the reasons I think people like to say, you know, use THC and CBD together. They work, they work better together. Um, and in truth, yeah, they work synergistically. Um, again, for, for, for patients who don't want the intoxicating or euphorogenic effects, we can use them in concert to diminish those sometimes unwanted effects of THC. Certainly sometimes they are wanted. Um, and then CBD works on 65 and counting other receptor targets and enzyme targets. You know, it works on the serotonin system and the opioid system, and I can list many other systems, but CBD works well throughout the body in so many ways. Um, phytochemicals in general do. So we, we talk a lot these days about the entourage effect of cannabis, but in our clinics, we talk about botanical synergy because we recognize also the benefit of including other botanicals in a formulation with cannabinoids or outside of it. We might be recommending your cannabis product plus your echinacea, plus your mushrooms, um, along with a whole other host of things to address. I was gonna ask you about that in terms of the, um, the patient populations that you're uh, ministering to. Um, how much of it is strictly cannabis focused or it's generally cannabis is a, a piece of the puzzle uh, and other herbs or holistic healing modalities or maybe non-holistic, maybe pharmaceutical modalities yeah. would play into it. Yeah. Uh, how generally does that work in, in your practice? Well, 100% of patients are coming to us looking for a cannabis solution. You know, our, our clinics are called the American Cannabinoid Clinics. It's, it's in the name. People know what they're gonna get when they come to us. But we do a lot of redirecting as soon as those patients hit the chair. Uh, we teach about the endocannabinoid system and all the things that stimulate it. And, and so folks will leave with the understanding that nutrition comes first, followed by, if not equal to, uh, phytocannabinoids, cannabis. Because again, cannabis is the most versatile botanical that we know that works on that system. So along with nutrition, which is foundational, Right? We need that to survive. None of us are gonna survive on cannabis alone. We need to be eating the natural whole foods that our body requires to even create new cells, right? So we have to address that. 
But then, like I said, cannabis is a close second. Um, but we get into detoxification for the endocannabinoid system, uh, supplementing with other botanicals to tone and um, help soothe the endocannabinoid system. We talk about stress reduction. We talk about spirituality. I mean, we're talking about everything that modulates that system. I haven't said the fancy new word yet I'm, uh, that I, I mentioned yesterday, cannabimimetics. So we speak in terms of cannabinoids and cannabimimetics. And cannabimimetics really do encompass just about everything else that we talk about, right? So cannabimimetics are um, substances, non-cannabis substances or practices that stimulate that endocannabinoid system too. So again, we have our cannabinoids, then we have everything that falls under the cannabimimetic category, which is nutrition, detoxification, supplementation, physical activity, deep breathing, yoga, meditation, acupuncture. I mean, the list, the list goes on there. We talk to patients about all of those things. One last question, sort of food for thought. You have emphasized the significance of diet, and you mentioned specifically the omega-3, the omega-6, the essential oils as being very, very important, if nothing else, building blocks for components of the endocannabinoid system. I'm not one who believes there is a per one perfect diet. You know, mm -hmm. diets do vary culture to culture, place to place. But if you were to outline you know, some of the do's and don'ts in terms of a diet that uh, facilitates healthy yeah. endocannabinoid functioning, what would that be? What would that yeah. look like? Natural, whole foods. I agree. When, when we eat natural whole foods, it doesn't matter if you're a vegetarian, a vegan, um, uh, a paleo or a keto, you know, subscriber, you are really, how can I say this? That's like 50% of the battle right there. Just eating real food, right? Our overly processed foods um, are hard to digest. You know, you can make the case of using digestive enzymes to help us digest these overly processed foods, but the fact of the matter is these chemicals and preservatives are really hard to break down. And for the most part, we're not getting the nutritional benefit from a lot of these processed foods because we just can't break them down. We don't have the capacity, the capability to break those things down. Prebiotics, probiotics, those are also great to supplement a diet with, but natural whole foods, and I, I feel like when people convert to a truly natural and whole food diet, within 30 to 60 days, they're feeling 40, 50, maybe even 60% better than they did already. When we then shift some emphasis onto foods that are higher in fat, we see an even better outcome. Um, so healthy fats are really healthy key. Healthy fats are so, so, so important. And you know, even in our, in our clinic, we talk about the ketogenic diet a lot, um, but you can, ha you can have a whole plant-based ketogenic diet that works really well for you. Um, and then you can have what we call a traditional ketogenic diet where you are eating protein from meat sources and do really well. For us, the emphasis is on getting that fat. Yeah, high quality fats. Um, some really great high quality fats are top hemp seed oil, right? Um, olive oil, coconut oil, avocado oil, those are all really great um, to use daily. Uh, you know, I typically recommend getting five to seven to, if you're a woman, and six to nine tablespoons of a high quality fat every single day. You know, the preferred fuel of all of our cells is fat. Out of fat comes our omegas that we need for uh, the basic building blocks for anandamide and 2-EG and our secondary endocannabinoids. By consuming a low fat diet, even if it's natural and whole in nature, um, we, we are still behind the eight ball. So natural whole foods, step one, step two, begin to increase your healthy fat consumption. And th that to me is a diet for, uh, or a recipe for uh, modulating the endocannabinoid system. So I think a take home message, uh, what I'm hearing from you is that cannabis is very important in terms of a healing modality, but it really works best in conjunction with healthy diet, healthy Absolutely. lifestyle. And, I think that's a good note to end yeah. on, and I appreciate very much your, your insights Thank and sharing you. that with Hi. us, Dr. Rachel Knox. And that's been another edition of Cannabis Conversations. Thank you. <laughs>